All right, we're live. So uh, welcome to another incubator chat uh, where Serum Science is here uh, mentoring the uh, companies that were selected to the uh, incubator. And we're going to have these chats. We're just going to uh, give some of our experience here once a week, every Friday um, on, uh, at 11 uh, Pacific. And we're going to try to have a guest every week. And this time we have uh, Francis here from uh, Kudu. Hi, Francis. Hey, Ami. Nice to be here. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what Matkudu is and what you're planning to do here in the incubator. Absolutely. So yeah, we're, I'm a founder at Matkudu, and we were fortunate enough to make it into the uh, incubator program this year to be part of the, the Einstein cohort. So what we do and why we fit into the program is we're a predictive analytics vendor. And uh, the way we apply predictive analytics is to help uh, salespeople be more relevant in every interaction they have with their customers. So what we do is we ingest uh, all of the data that's available uh, from first party and third party for our B2B SaaS customers. And uh, we digest all of that information to create actionable recommendations for reps to increase their conversion rates. That's cool. And that's exactly the kind of uh, you know application that Salesforce is looking for for enterprise type clients. Absolutely. And yeah, um, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out with uh, the new rollout of, uh, of Einstein, which I think is, uh, um, you know, aligned with what we're seeing in the market where, um, you know, the technology aspect of machine learning and predictive analytics is no longer the main differentiator. It's now really more focused about what is the core value customers get from uh, the applications of the machine learning. And I think Salesforce, um, you know, making this uh, these predictive algorithms available and um, kind of democratizing it is just helping uh, companies focus more on the value aspect of the model rather than the pure technological aspect of it. Right, and actually, this week we had um, Prediction IO come here for um, for office hours. We had uh, Sarah Asher that was uh, very enthusiastic and. Um, Informative about Prediction IO. Um, I'd say that uh, specifically for Prediction IO, it's it's really great that Salesforce is making it available. It's still kind of like a do-it-yourself uh, machine learning platform, so it's it's it, it, you can't really uh, plug and play out of the box yet. But uh, you know, it's they're they're working toward that, and uh, I think that the common theme with those uh, discussions at the office hours were um, that companies are trying to figure out how to, um, you know, start get started with with prediction IO and how they implement that as part of their solutions. Absolutely, and I think it's really part of this. There, there's this danger where people think that machine learning and AI is going to be this. Uh, um, solve it all kind of solution that just works directly out of out of the box. Where I think again, the I mean, having been a data scientist for many years, I know that the the hardest part about machine learning and data science is what I call the janitorial part of the work, which is getting the data, preparing it, feature engineering, feature selection. I mean, algorithms are now extremely commoditized. Uh, there's a bunch of different platforms out there to run algorithms. And I think uh, Prediction IO is a good one that fits now into the ecosystem. So it's just another way of making it easy for people to run the algorithms. But there's still a very uh, complicated part in the, in the process of building a product around figuring out what are we optimizing for. Now that we know what we're optimizing for and what algorithms are available, what data do we push into it? And how do we shape that data to make sure that the algorithm can learn from it? Um, so I'm really excited and having we. We've had a long relationship with uh, with Simon even before the uh, the acquisitions. We were super excited for them to to get acquired because I think they really had. Um, it was very clever uh, to not focus for them too much on um, the full solution of feature engineering, but more focusing on providing Salesforce with the technological um, platform that enables to run all these models directly. And I think that's a really great addition to uh, the platform that is Salesforce, and it really fits into. Uh, I think the overall go-to-market of Salesforce, where they where they provide this extremely powerful platform, but you need to know how to use it, and that's why there's great companies like you guys to help 
people are trying to build products or use the product actually figure out how to fine tune it. And I think Friction IO is another example of that, and it's probably going to lead to a new generation of SIs. And we have a couple in the in the batch that are going to be focusing on how do you fine tune this entire new platform that is nascent uh, with Einstein. It, it, it's it's really interesting because that fine tuning even it, we we played with uh, integrating Watson to Salesforce even a couple of years ago, and and that fine tuning is such a key process that you're getting into it, you're not really aware of. It's, it's right. completely necessary because the data needs to be massaged and um, all the components that you talked about are, is, you know, I completely echo that. Right, and for us it's always been interesting because we, I mean, we deal a lot, of course, being a predictive analytics vendor, one of the things we always deal with is the in-house competition. And I think Salesforce, you know, releasing uh, Einstein and Watson and Azure, all these products are uh, just helping companies feel like they can build um, all these models in-house. I think the big part people are missing is that the configuration is really the, the hard component. And one example I always give is um, we once built an algorithm um, and one of the, the features that was uh, really interesting is that zip code was highly predictive. Um, and the thing is that zip code in itself is a very sparse data set. There's very little information because there's a lot of zip codes and very few companies within the same zip code. But now if you try to extract information from this data set by saying, let's go from zip code to uh, the pricing per square foot of office space. And now from that, we're going to rank it into D cells. And now we're going to basically allocate for each zip code what D cell in uh, pricing per square foot. And now you actually have something that does uh, support a lot of information and actually has a strong predictive capability. But the thing is, no algorithm today is able to extract that, um, you know, that kind of intelligence into how you're going to generate that feature, engineer it, select it to then feed it into the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the component where you really need strong expert knowledge. And again, that's why I think there's like Einstein is just going to, you know, generate a new uh, breed of SIs and vendors who actually are going to leverage the predictive capabilities to figure out what is the right information to, to push into it to solve uh, an important business need. Right, and, and again, it's it's really important that it's all part of an enterprise solution, I think, and a platform. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, what else did we have uh, this week? We actually had our first demo jam in the incubator. It was closed only for the, gen, uh, the incubator here. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Mike Creedon was uh, kind of putting on the timer for us, uh, three minutes each, uh, no exceptions. Um, Glassbreakers won it. Um, Sean from our team um, demoed the, how we integrated the data discovery, the Einstein data discovery into um, our landing club. And uh, you, you had a demo too, how did that go? I think the demo went well. It's uh, it's always interesting to uh, to see how different companies approach these uh, these different demos. Um, we wanted to focus on a very very small piece of uh, of what we've done, and it was actually something that we launched on uh, Segment.com. One of our customers, uh, you know, a couple hours before the demo jam, and uh, for me, I think the way we're going to approach a lot of these demo jams is um, a way to uh, surface some very actionable use cases that are supported by, uh, by the product rather than um, going into you know, the depth of um, new features. I think one, one way we've consistently been uh, approaching Mad Kudu is to, to make sure that whatever we build is actionable and always drives value for the, for the customers. So we have a very customer first uh, approach. And it's, uh, it's interesting because we've now started working into this cadence of figuring out for demo jam, we need to have almost a form of a standalone version of MadFu that we can demo. And it's, um, it was interesting to see the feedback. We actually had two companies from the batch approach us after the demo and ask us uh, if they could get uh, this feature onto their, uh, onto their platform. So it's always exciting when you're able to you know, bundle the product into a small uh, value proposition from a technical footprint standpoint, mm -hmm. but that shows enough value that people get excited about it and actually want to go and implement. And that's what we're constantly striving to uh, to find. And that's one of the main reasons why we're uh, excited to be part of the incubator is to get exposure to even a larger ecosystem than right. the uh, incubies and actually start showing this and seeing how things resonate to actually um, then go to market with some of these ideas and you know start to land and expand. Uh, right.
Yeah, I think that uh, the, the experience of the, the demo jam in general was was really great because just just like the other uh, other people from the incubator uh, came back after it and talked to us about what we've done and how we've done it, and the, that collaboration that, that happens, um, you know, from little things like the demo jam is is really uh, you know engaging and. Makes me makes you think further and deeper. Right, and I think it was very interesting because uh, internally on some of the Slack channels, there were a lot of companies who were uh, pinging Mike multiple times, saying, "What's the format? What is the objective? What is the goal?" I'm really happy that that was not answered because <laughs> it was very cool to see how each of the different companies were actually thinking about what is the goal of the demo jam. Right. Is it to pitch the way we would pitch to an investor, like the elevator pitch? Is it to pitch to the other companies in the incubator to get feedback? Is it to just showcase uh, a win of the week and kind of get the team pumped up and get other people to give feedback about it? So I, I thought that was very interesting to see how people uh, approached it and I hope everyone is gonna reflect on that and, uh, and use that as a learning for the next demo jam. I think it's very different from, uh, so we went through Techstars Boulder two years ago where uh, the demos and the pitch was very, very investor oriented. So it, you know there was a clear process. We knew exactly what we were trying to achieve. I like this uh, more open format, given the fact that you know we're at very different stages of uh, of go to market and life cycles. Uh, so it's definitely interesting to see how you know other people are approaching it and what we can learn from that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we chose to basically take one piece. And just talk about that one piece uh, in, in the three minutes instead of you know everything about the lending cloud, which you know for the audience here could be just boring, you know, right. not, not relevant. So we talk more about the the Einstein features that we've integrated. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, some other common themes uh, this week. Uh, I think actually many of the companies uh, working on getting their Salesforce uh, partnership going, and um, you know there there are two tracks here. There's the administrative of talking to Salesforce about um, you know partnership and uh, how the partnership looks like, what kind, what type. There's several types, obviously, uh, to be an ISV, OEM. Um, Several ISV partnerships, and also there's a technical tr track of getting access to features, and as part of being a partner and starting to like creating your packaging org, starting to build it. Well, where are you guys at uh, in that process? Yeah, so we just started the process, and it was uh, that's for us uh, one of the big goals of actually joining the incubator is mm -hmm. kind of fast tracking the the process of getting into the app exchange. Um, you know, most of our customers uh, currently are on Salesforce. So just like getting, being able to get more exposure, um, getting to know best practices as to how we want to market this, how do we want to position it. Um, you know, there's so many different options, I think, because again, Salesforce is, I always say this, Salesforce can do anything and nothing. It, it can do anything, literally, you can do anything with Salesforce, but if you don't know how to configure it, it won't do anything. Um, and I think the uh, getting into the app exchange is very similar. There's so many different ways of approaching becoming a partner, different ways of marketing on the, the app exchange that you can get lost into uh, into the process. And so it's been super helpful to have you guys walk us through the process, understand what we're trying to achieve, what our customers would typically look like, what they would be looking for to figure out what is the best approach to getting into the app exchange. And then you know, being part of the family now, um, is just helping a ton in you know getting the right uh, conversation started with the right people at um, at Salesforce and just you know having everyone be a couple blocks uh, down the road just helps right. being able to go and meet in person um, and it just is just facilitating the uh, the process a ton even though it still it still requires a lot of thinking as to what is the best approach uh, with our context, with the context of our customers, with the context of how Salesforce is positioning itself right. uh, to actually go and market this. Yeah, so it, it's actually, it's true both on the app exchange side and the enterprise side. You know, Salesforce, I tell people, whatever you can do in .NET or Java, you can do in Salesforce. And that's true uh, on the enterprise side where uh, 
problem is people think that they get Salesforce and everything is there for them. You still have to adapt it to your process. And that's your unique process. Salesforce can't shrink wrap your process. Right. So, um, and you can do it maybe in point, point and click, and maybe it's development, and you know the, there's a platform to to uh, support you. And and on the app exchange side, obviously it's the same. You have uh, different ways to building app apps. Uh, you know we we talked this week about different ways that um, you know you can do things, and we kind of uh, you know figure that best to go, you know, small as possible first, get in, and then start building around it, which, um, you know, I think normally is a, is a good strategy. Yeah, and I think we're very similar to the the company who was on the, uh, who was speaking last week, uh, where I think they were also going the approach of the, the connected app route, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is a, is a pretty interesting new, uh, um, new offering. Right, and I think that a lot of the incubator companies and, and anybody building app exchange apps needs to think about who are the users and think about the totality of the users on the platform. It could be, um, you know, service people, so salespeople. It could be the client of the customer that you install the app on. Um, it could be the partner of the customer. So there's. Uh, different user stories, and you kind of have to figure where you fit and adjust your app okay. or build your app around that. And I think that was probably the most uh, eye-opening moment, I guess, was when you asked us to think, what is the um, what is the flow from an acquisition standpoint for a customer to discover you guys? To like, how does it work? Like, are, if they find you on the app exchange, what happens next? What do you want to happen next? I think it was very relevant to see that. You know, in some cases, everything is in Salesforce and you're just a plug into Salesforce, so you want to live fully on the App Exchange. But if you're integrating with you know, 20 other systems and you're basically bringing all this data into Salesforce, then it's a very different user journey. And understanding that user journey is a pretty important milestone to then determine what is the best offering to have on the App Exchange. I think that was really helpful to go um, over that thinking to figure out what is our best approach to the, to the App Exchange. Yeah, and I think you're definitely on, on a good path now, um, and hopefully get the administrative stuff out of the way quickly, so you should build the app. Um, I think another thing that came about uh, this week was uh, one of your guys came in and, and said that you have a client that needs uh, some <laughs> additional process that uh, on Salesforce um, that is not really related to your application. And it, it brought up a conversation between us about, um, you know, how to mesh services and product in the same offering. If that does that make sense to use partners? Um, you know, where does the revenue stream come from? Where where, where do you stand right. on that? It's interesting because then I, I had a, a longer conversation about this uh, with an investor uh, yesterday night, cool. and it, it's definitely something that. Um, you know, again, is a, I think a very strong inspiration from uh, from Salesforce at our previous company. We we're always talking about Salesforce with this kind of dual model of uh, there's the pure SaaS aspect of it, and then there's the service aspect of it. And there's services that are provided by Salesforce, but there's also this very large uh, group of SIs and vendors who can provide additional services on top of the platform. And I think it's um, the way we've been approaching it so far is to think of it as um, almost like a product maturity, um, you know, evolution where when we started, of course, you start, you have barely any piece of, uh, any piece of code that, you know, that works. So when we really started, there was a lot of service uh, that we're, we we're trying to figure out what is the part that we want to maintain as service? What is the part that we now want to automate and build as part of the core functionality of the product? And essentially your product then grows this way and you see which are the areas where you're getting the most traction from and the most uh, need from your customers. And today we're still in this process where the product has grown and delivers core functionality, but we know that to get to what we call EVR, which is our economic value realization, which is making sure the customer is getting value from the product, there are components where the customer has to do something with the product. And right now we're doing a lot of this through support and services. Uh, but we are starting to look at leveraging the partner ecosystem, um, you know, to educate some of these uh, SIs and partners uh, to be able to configure Mad Kudu within Salesforce for our customers to get the highest value out of it. 
Uh, so it's definitely it's something that we're constantly working on, and it's a it's a big part of the um, our customer adoption plan that we're putting together, that we're refining and actually presenting to the, to the Salesforce team. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because the ecosystem has, obviously they have the SIs that are uninterested in, in services. You have the product companies, ISVs that are uninterested in providing product. You do have the hybrids where, um, you know, a product team also provides professional services uh, as related to their products. Uh, but you have a lot of, um, you know, product companies that basically team up with um, service companies that to kind of provide the, the next level um, support and I think it from a, an app exchange uh, partner perspective it's really important to understand where your skill set is where do you want to focus and basically you make that decision of you know what what if you want to provide services what services at what level is it just support is it uh, more than that yeah, absolutely. I think it, it always goes back to you, you should outsource what is not core value of the of the offering. And we were talking about this at one of the Salesforce events where there was uh, this gentleman who was um, who had an engineering outsourcing firm and was trying to figure out, you know, like this, how could companies here work with them? And I was telling them at the end of the day, if if the engineering and the technical aspect of what you're providing is core. Then you should not outsource it because right. that's your core value. Um, I think for us, we're still trying to figure out within the things that people have to do with our product to, you know, get the most value from it. We're still figuring out what are the pieces that are core value and what are the pieces that we can uh, that we can outsource. And again, it's like this. Um, Einstein is going to, I think, disrupt what is core value by making the machine learning uh, capabilities something that now is you know easily outsourceable yeah. and i think it will i think it's exciting because it will shed a light on uh, what is the true value of ai and machine learning which is solving a problem understanding what that problem is and feeding the right data into the pipeline to solve it and i feel like today there's too little emphasis and focus on this actual business problem and too much uh focus on um like the coolness of uh, of the AI. I mean, that's true. Was you know DeepMind. I mean, they great you know great AI to beat someone at Go, but that algorithm is not good today at you know figuring out uh, which of your leads are kind of going to become MQLs or SQLs because that's not what it's trained for. Um, and the guys from um, Amy.ai gave a great talk where they explained. Uh, so they uh, they do a lot of uh, language processing. They're a, a bot to do uh, sales assistance. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was really interesting is that they explained that they basically take the analogy of manufacturing, where when you started the first few cars, you had three engineers who knew how to build a car from start to end. And then slowly we broke it down into smaller components. And then you had people who were specialized in doing one task. And then the next component was now we're going to use um, you know uh, robots to actually do that. And I think it's the same approach to, uh, to AI and machine learning where you want algorithms to be very specific at few tasks and then you want to build a core large automation that actually takes the end-to-end -end flow. But architecturing that end-to-end -end flow, that's actually hard because it means you need to understand, you need an architect to understand what is the problem we're solving, what is the input, what are the different functional blocks, and now we're going to go and configure them. And I think that's... Um, and you really need to know the business problem. Yep. And that's where potentially you want to say, you know, as a product company, maybe that's not something we want to do, understand the, the, the specific business problem of every client. Right. And maybe it is. And that's the part that is, that is, it's, right. it's interesting at this point in time where so many things are, uh, there's so many moving parts uh, that we want to figure out. Yeah. Still, still evolving. Right. Yeah. Always. Yeah. So uh, I think that uh, we're kind of out of time for today. Uh, thanks a lot, Francis, for uh, joining me. Um, again, we're going to have these talks uh, once a week, every Friday at uh, 11 Pacific to Eastern um, on Periscope. Um, we'll also post it uh, on our blog afterwards. Uh, hope to see you next week. See ya. Right. See ya.